uh, change that uh, ability to become infected uh, a great deal. That again wanes over time, um, uh, and there is a time-based process to that. Um, but that protection against infection is is diminished again in, in Omicron. That's quite clear. Again. With a booster, it goes back towards the same levels as Delta. It will be a, an important and is already becoming an important part of our control of the current Omicron wave in Australia. It is not enough by itself. The public health and social measures that have been introduced in many states in the, in the last few days will assist with that as well. The, um, uh, the, the personal protective uh, elements of, of, that we all know so well, you would have noticed at the beginning of this press conference, both the minister and I were wearing masks. I'm wearing a mask wherever I'm indoors in a public setting uh, and wherever I cannot uh, guarantee um, uh, to be uh, socially distanced. So that, that is an important component uh, and we've seen that change in recent days. Um, the, the final uh, thing I would say, just to stress a couple of the of these small print details within the ATAGI advice, um, and this really goes to the heart of protecting the most vulnerable first. So, we really do encourage people to come forward if they are in those well-known vulnerable groups for severe infection. People uh, who are our, elder, um, our elders in the, in the, uh, in the population, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, those with chronic disease, those who are immunocompromised, you now can get that fourth dose. That will be your booster if you are eligible with that four-month interval uh, going to three months later in the month. Um, and uh, and I just just a real shout out to anyone who is pregnant or is or is planning to be pregnant. These these vaccines are very safe in pregnancy. Uh, we know now very clearly um, that both um, the woman who is pregnant and their uh, unborn child they are both at risk uh, from from um, um, this virus. And vaccine does protect and is safe. So that is very important for anyone is, who has not yet had their primary dose uh, schedule or are eligible for a booster, um, please do not hesitate just because you are in those categories. Minister. Thanks, Paul. Uh, now I'll start with uh, those in the room on the uh, left-hand side front as you're looking out, if that's the right place. Minister, can I ask, or actually Chief Medical Officer, can I ask you, for an Australian watching this, just simply, what has changed? So Targi's looked at this a few times in recent weeks. On a simple basis, what's changed? And then my next question, if it's if three, every three months you have to get one, are we looking at four jabs a year for Australians going forward? So firstly, what, what's changed? And I mentioned that we've only known about this virus for four weeks, but in, in the last week, in fact, last night and the night before, there was more evidence that came around the, the protective effect of boosters, but also um, that, that waning ele element. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, the best evidence they've got at the moment is for, uh, is for four or th between three and four months, essentially, um, uh, for the reasons of implementation. We've gone with, with the four months for, they have, they have advised on the four months uh, for, to start. And as the minister said, that's a, a large, large increase in the numbers that will be eligible, uh, and going towards three months when that that can be implemented. Um, it's it, throughout this for, throughout this uh, this uh, vaccination schedule. There's a, there's a sense that everyone uh, wants to be vaccinated on the first day an announcement is made. That is not necessary, and indeed, it's not possible. Um, we know that we have huge numbers of points of presence, around 10,000 10, places you can get a jab at the moment. Um, and that is continuing. At, at National Cabinet, the PM uh, announced the other day when we had our press conference that, um, uh, that the states and territories are doing their bit. They've, they've committed to go back to peak um, uh, clinic use. We have our GPs, our pharmacists, Aboriginal community controlled uh, organisations. They're all available. They will all be doing booster shots. They're already doing booster shots and that will roll out a as we go. In terms of what happens in the future, that's the future. Let's, let's deal with this, this booster at the moment. This is specifically and particularly related to the changes from the Omicron variant. Uh, and we know, as I said, that uh, one, one booster with the generic booster gives a good boost um, to protection both on, in infection and particularly and most importantly in severe disease. What happens in the future with future um, uh, variants if they come, uh, that's a matter for the future, but we're certainly looking at that very closely. Yeah, I'll just add something to that. Um, uh, and that is, of course, as, uh, as Paul was saying, it's four weeks um, since uh, we've been aware of uh, the Omicron variant. And uh, the world has learned a lot 
uh, particularly the combination of uh, effectively uh, more transmissible but less severe. And uh, that's a, an evolution that uh, the epidemiologists have uh, explained is not uncommon in relation to the, the course of a, uh, a virus. Um, and so we've adapted as we've had that information and Australians have adapted. Uh, we were due on the six-month time frame, which had uh, been the international norm and Atagi's uh, uh, recommendation prior to Omicron, to have had approximately 1.3 million vaccinations by now uh, of uh, people who were eligible. We're, uh, as I say, at 2 million today. So we've been able to step up, bring more people forward. Uh, I said over 500,000 uh, ahead of that schedule, well over 500,000 is the correct answer. And so, as we've done throughout the pandemic, um, a, a virus the likes of which the world hasn't seen since the Spanish flu, so for a hundred years, uh, we've been able to adapt. And uh, you know, we have, in my view, the best medical advisors in the world, the National Incident Centre, the Chief Medical Officers Team, um, uh, ATAGI and others. They've done a magnificent job and they've just never stopped. So I want to give a particular thanks to them uh, in a world of uncertain information, uh, they've helped provide a guiding light and stability for the nation. I'll start uh, front left, uh, uh, light blue shirt. Sorry, I, I'm blind as a bat without uh, being in the yeah. book. <coughs> I'm at home. Um, Professor, the, uh, Targi says in this statement here that um, a Targi expects the boost of vaccination alone will not be sufficient to event a surge due to Omicron. I think everyone kind of knows that Omicron's around and it's going to be here. But surge, surge numbers that are data reported, do you think that helps or scares people? You know, when they hear there's 5,000, when you go out, you, you hear the people are saying, oh, 5,000 today in New South Wales, or when your number's there, do you think that's helping people to get the booster, or is it kind of scaring people? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it's a bit of both. Um, look, we've, we've been saying, the Minister, myself, the Prime Minister, and others have been saying for quite some time, cases are not the most important thing at the moment. Most of those cases, the vast majority of those cases, are mild or asymptomatic. However, we have talked about transmission, and so what we're seeing in other parts of the world is a doubling rate of cases uh, every two or three days, and that is what we're seeing here. Um, we're not seeing that same sort of increase in hospitalisations or ICU, and I think they're the most important metrics for people to look at. People should be uh, alert to this, um, take it uh, particularly with this announcement today, make that booking uh, in, the, in the new year to get that booster if you are uh, becoming eligible in, that, in the new year period. If you're eligible now, don't hesitate, get it today. Uh, and, uh, yep, sorry, go, go on, Pierre, uh, Minister. Sorry, no, uh, uh, that's a promotion. Uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I won't take it. Um, it, it look, very briefly, uh, in terms of uh, ventilation, um, on the 15th of December, and I mentioned these figures yesterday, there were 54 Australians uh, uh, in a hospital uh, under ventilation with COVID. As of uh, the figures from last night uh, that the National Incident Centre has, uh, there were 53 Australians in hospital with COVID. Now, that may change during the course of the morning and that will change over uh, over coming weeks, but that's a, a, an important indication of uh, the fact that whilst this is a more transmissible disease, it does appear to be less severe. And uh, we're taking these precautions to add the extra uh, protection for Australians and to help them stay ahead of the curve. And then uh, going behind. Professor Kelly, um, just on those dates, the 4th of January and the 31st of January, is that health advice or is that just the, logis the sheer logistical challenge? As in, the system is not ready to bring forward the boosters yet. Can you sort of explain about why it's staggered in this way and why you know, people might be wondering, well, why can't I have it now? So I, I think there's, it's based on the, on, the, on the science and the medical advice. Uh, we, we know that it is not a, an immediate thing when, when the vaccine starts to wear off. It's a time-based thing. And so again, as we've done all the way through the process is we've, we've prioritised the ones that are at most, most at risk. Um, it, nowhere in the world has done, uh, when we got to our peak of, of vaccination, we, we were around 2.2 million doses a week. That, that on a per capita basis was leading the world. Uh, that's, what, that's what we aim to get to and achieve and, and to exceed uh, during January. 
Uh, but at this time, uh, when, and the Minister has already mentioned the exhaustion of our, of our health workforce, um, it is just not feasible uh, to suddenly give uh, those large numbers uh, their doses uh, during this period. Now, as I said, that they will be the, the prioritisation is definitely for those that are most at risk, uh, and so that will continue to be that. In terms of the, the advice, the ATAGI is the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation. Um, they do and must take into account the programmatic and implementation elements of this, uh, and they've discussed that with us. Uh, and then it is our, it's the government's job to be able to, to follow that advice, as we've done all throughout this, pandem this pandemic, and we will continue to do so and implement their, their uh, advice. And just one of those programmatic issues is the five-year-olds to 11-year-olds coming online on the 10th of January. Is that, is that why the three-month is delayed for later in January? Well, th there's no uh, change to uh, that. Uh, yeah. Minister? No, I might add. Mm. Uh, we're uh, uh, intended to do two things. Uh, one is to ensure that we have the uh, children's vaccines uh, and uh, I think uh, there would be no Australians uh, that I hope would want us to delay or defer childhood vaccination. That's proceeding precisely according to schedule. The TGA is making great progress with their batch testing. Uh, we have the first doses uh, that are in country that are going through those processes and uh, important tick-offs and milestones being achieved. Uh, the second thing is to ensure that the booster program continues. And of course, there's a third element for those uh, small numbers that haven't had first or second doses to deliver those. Uh, but what this does is it will mean that there are seven and a half million Australians uh, who are eligible from the 4th of January. Um, that includes those that will uh, already have had eligibility and uh, by then uh, we will have had uh, well past the two million figure uh, that will have been boosted. And so that gives them uh, that immediate opportunity and those are overwhelmingly uh, older Australians or more immunocompromised Australians uh, who have, uh, have been less recently vaccinated. So, uh, of course, there has to be a priority program. Uh, the alternative of suddenly putting an extra four million people uh, who would displace the older uh, or more immunocompromised and less recently vaccinated uh, is absolutely at odds with the uh, right way. I know there was somebody who mentioned this yesterday um, that was, uh, uh, in my view, uh, absolutely against the medical advice. And so it's all about following the medical advice and making sure that there's an orderly stage process. And then by the end of January, um, we will have approximately 16 million people who will be eligible. And eligibility commences the window of vaccination. Uh, going to the back, please. Uh, Professor, just uh, on the January timeframe bringing forward now, we're going to have some immunocompromised people um, who had their third shot in October or November then become eligible. How do they go with, do they take a fourth shot or do they wait for updated health advice in January? And then perhaps for the Minister, or I'm not sure if this is for you, Professor, how are we going to start measuring vaccination rates, giving the waning protection when we hear premiers saying we don't need to bring in certain restrictions because we're above 90 percent how do we update those rates if people you know aren't boosted and and their vaccination and protection have waned um so a number of questions there firstly just very specifically for those who are immunocompromised uh, they'll they'll be due at that same time period after their third dose rather than their second dose so their fourth dose will be um in, if they're over four months um, uh, on the 4th of January, there'd be very few in that category. Um, but by the end of, of January, they'd be due for their fourth dose, many of them. Uh, in terms of the, of the reporting and so forth, well, we've, we've had you know, very open reporting about, about the uh, first and second doses. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to the Minister about what we might be doing in terms of reporting boosters, but we've, we've said some of those figures today. Uh, and uh, the latest I saw was we were at 57 per cent already of the, of the people that were eligible today have had their vaccine. And pleasingly, that's a higher rate for those in that, in the, uh, above the age of 70, uh, uh, those higher risk people. Yep. Minister? Right. Uh, look, uh, Paul's absolutely correct. Uh, as of today, it's about 57.7 per cent of eligible people uh, who have uh, had their boosters. Uh, as uh, Professor Kelly says, uh, uh, that's a higher figure still amongst the older Australians. Uh, and so that's very heartening, knowing that many of them have only 
very recently, only you know in the last 10 days, uh, become eligible. So they've stepped forward, and some of them are only becoming eligible you know yesterday uh, or the day before. Um, and uh, at this point in time, I think yesterday, 90,000 more people were vaccinated than became eligible on uh, on that day. So 147,000. Uh, became uh, were vaccinated with boosters yesterday, um, and that was 90,000 more than were uh, freshly eligible on that day. So each day, new people become eligible. Uh, the uh, the second thing is that we publish all the figures. Um, I think on a daily basis, we publish approximately 700 different data points and make them available. Uh, in addition to that, um, there's another over 3,000 weekly data points. So you've got uh, seven. Uh, you know, uh, more than 700 uh, uh, data points a day, published daily, close to 5,000 uh, a week, and then another 3,000 that are published uh, weekly. So um, our approach has just been to provide that information, uh, first doses, second dose to doses, uh, booster rates, uh, state-based rates, age cohort rates, uh, 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 Indigenous disability, aged care, all of these are uh, done on a daily basis and, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, going across to the uh, middle rear, please. Um, in terms of public health measures that are being introduced because of this fourth wave, looking at the data overseas, is it likely we're going to be living with these restrictions for most of 2022? And just secondly, with all these new people coming, becoming eligible, the 16, uh, sorry, the 16 million by the end of um, January and the 7.5 million by the 4th of January, do we have enough vaccines in the country um, right now? Yes, so we have 20 million vaccines that are in the country now, uh, more than 5 million that are in the field on the basis of orders. So we've provided to the states and territories, pharmacies and GPs, uh, all of their orders. Uh, they're working on a, uh, a high volume access and uh, if uh, more is uh, uh, requested, we're happy to provide it. So one of the things we did, uh, and some may have uh, raised their eyes at the time um, when we ordered uh, 60 million Pfizer for 2022 and 15 million uh, Moderna for 2022, uh, we were uh, anticipating that there may need to be uh, a third and a fourth dose. Um, there was no medical advice to that effect at that point in time, but we were anticipating that there may need to be a third and a fourth dose. Uh, and indeed, there's enough for, uh, with those figures for five doses uh, and the uh, Novavax, which is making its way uh, through the TGA, and that's progressing well. And there's an extra 51 million doses of Novavax. So we're in a fortunate position with doses in country, doses in the field and doses to come, uh, whether a fourth or a fifth dose uh, were required. We just provisioned... Uh, on uh, the absolute highest need, worst case scenario. Uh, across to the right, please. Oh, sorry, just on restrictions as well, um, living with restrictions ah. into 2022, perhaps, <clears throat> Professor Kelly. Um, uh, thank you. So we, we've, we've seen many waves around the world um, and we know how they go. Uh, and they generally last for a month or two and then drop down again. Uh, that's pretty much a standard wave of this particular type of virus. I expect that's what we'll be seeing here in Australia. Very rapid rise in cases, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks. What that peak will actually be will, will very much depend on, on the two main uh, weapons that we have, or three, the same as we've had all the way through. The booster program is part of that vaccination program. Get out and get your booster, get out and get your vaccination, that will help. Public health and social measures, they're a matter for the states, but there are you know, general principles and there's a quite, I think, now a pretty close alignment across most of the states in relation to that, even Western Australia today with their mask mandate over the next few days. Um, and the third, third one is test, trace, isolate and quarantine. We've been given uh, specific instructions. I and AHPPC have been given instructions to come back to National Cabinet in the first week of January uh, to look at what Omicron does in relation to what we can and should be doing in test, trace, isolate and quarantine. What is the role of rapid antigen tests, for example? What sort of things should we be taking into account in terms of our contact tracing when we have these large numbers? Uh, what should we be doing in terms of people staying at home if they are found to be positive or a close contact? Definitions of close contacts. These are all being looked at very rapidly now uh, in the light of this new uh, phenomenon. 
Great. And on the right-hand side front, please. Okay. Um, question probably for the Minister and then separate to the CMO. Minister, some pharmacists are still claiming they're having trouble getting access towards the end of the year for vaccines and being told to wait. Your advice to them and also an update on the aged care booster rollout if possible. And then I might ask the CMO to reflect on his Queensland colleague's comments yesterday about the virus being necessary to spread as we move into the endemic phase of this emergency. Sure. Uh, uh, so firstly, with pharmacy, we've seen uh, record numbers throughout the uh, uh, the last uh, 10 days. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had uh, in our pharmacies across Australia uh, 52,294 vaccinations. That's more than triple what it was just a couple of weeks ago. And last week, there was an increase of 497 pharmacies who were delivering boosters. So I'd seen some reports uh, saying that... Uh, that there had been a decrease, uh, those statements were clearly categorically incorrect. And uh, the number of pharmacies delivering boosters last week increased by 497 compared with the week prior to that. Uh, today, we will pass 3 million doses delivered by our pharmacies. And uh, uh, we're, we're seeing extra orders and uh, they're being met. And uh, all up, uh, we have... Uh, uh, over 3,000, uh, I'll give you the exact number, over 3,400 pharmacies that are uh, in the field and delivering vaccines. And uh, what we're seeing is that uh, this week there are over 11,000 deliveries of either vaccines or consumables uh, coming from the vaccine operations centre. So there are no constraints on uh, numbers. Uh, on any one particular day, a particular pharmacy may have more demand than they previously expected, but we're able to meet that. And, and on the aged care rollout? Uh, aged care, so as I said yesterday, uh, we're uh, uh, approximately 300 facilities ahead of schedule. Uh, over 1,500 have been vaccinated at this point in time, and uh, we'll just continue to keep doing that. Uh, we'd urge those that are uh, eligible uh, to schedule as early as possible, but we're meeting uh, all of the uh, requests and uh, as we're approximately 300 facilities ahead of the schedule we'd anticipated. So I want to thank the facilities and thank the families for providing their support and consent. And on the uh, the, the Queensland uh, Chief Health Officer, I won't, I won't address those specifically, they're, they're his views, um, but we do know that for endemicity, uh, which means uh, essentially living with COVID, there are two ways that we can, that that, that will happen in terms of people being uh, gaining a protection against future disease. That's either getting the disease uh, or being vaccinated. I know which one I would choose. I have chosen, I've had my booster, so is the, so is the minister. Um, so that does give that extra level of protection and, and does protect you against at least severe disease. Uh, but it is inevitable uh, in this wave that there will be many people that also get infected. Uh, the reason is because unfortunately past infection uh, does not give Uh, or indeed where those things have become compulsory, please follow that, not because it's, they're compulsory, but because that's the right thing to do. And finally, for, for boosters or primary courses, do not hesitate, make that, make that vaccination appointment. There is plenty of vaccination, vaccines in the system to do so. Great, and then last question on the right-hand side at the back, please. Uh, Minister, we've heard the states on advice from their own health officials calling openly for days for a target to shorten the interval and seen repeated denials from yourself and Atagi to do so. Um, Minister, why the change of heart? Look, with great respect, uh, that's incorrect. Uh, what we've seen is that Atagi has already moved uh, on the basis of international evidence from six months to five months, and that's seen a uh, rapid increase in the uptake of boosters. Uh, and uh, what they've done is again, 
continuously review the international evidence and off the basis of the international evidence they've followed it. One of the things that's been a hallmark of Australia's approach to the vaccination program is listening to the medical advice and uh, we're blessed. Uh, as we lead into Christmas, I want to give this message. That is a message of, of thanks uh, to Australians for coming forward to be vaccinated, for keeping distance, for doing the difficult things that are so contrary to our nature but so fundamental to our success. Um, that's what has allowed us to have uh, one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, one of the lowest uh, rates mm. of loss of life, uh, and we've seen uh, over 870,000 cases in uh, the 24 hours uh, to reporting uh, yesterday midday uh, globally, just to put it in perspective, and at the same time, one of the strongest economic recoveries. So with all of those things, Australians have done extraordinarily well. And the key to it has been following that medical advice. And uh, uh, as part of that, I want to finish by thanking all of our doctors and nurses, our pathology collectors, our testers, uh, those people who are administering the vaccinations, those people who are running the vaccination program. Uh, General Fruin and his team at Operation COVID Shield, uh, Brendan Murphy and Penny Shakespeare uh, at the department, Professor Kelly uh, and his extraordinary team with uh, Professor uh, uh, Michael Kidd and Dr Sonia Bennett and Dr Ruth Vine and uh, Professor Alison McMillan. These are extraordinary Australians who've helped keep us safe. So these are challenging times, but we've got through it better than almost anybody. We'll continue to get through it better than almost anybody. And uh, what has set Australians apart is their support for each other and uh, the quality of the medical advice and uh, the commitment we have to following that medical advice and working with our medical advisors. So I want to thank everybody Wish them all the best uh, and uh, know that uh, by having a partnership between the Australian public to protect each other and to protect themselves and the medical community will continue to keep Australians safe. Take care, everyone, and have a great Christmas.